Hello, Gary. It's nice to be in your home. Well, uh, it's nice to have you here. Yeah. Thank you for agreeing to make this interview. We'll uh, go straight to the questions. Uh, the first one is, well, I'm personally an admirer of Colin Wilson's work. I think his work is very important. And I know that you wrote about Colin Wilson, quite a few works, and uh, you met him, right? Mm -hmm. Can you tell about your experience of how you first uh, got acquainted with uh, his works and then maybe him personally? Uh, well, I first um, came across his book, The Occult. That was the first book I read of his. That was in 1975. That was quite some time ago. Uh, this was when I was a musician in uh, New York. And I was um, living in a uh, run-down loft space on the Bowery, which was, uh, at the time, was a very sort of uh, down-and-out part of New York. Uh, and it wasn't very far from... Um, it was a famous club at the time that lots of bands were playing in CBGB, uh, and I was in a band that was playing uh, at that time. And um, in, the, uh, well, I, I should say that the band I was in was Blondie, and they, they later became quite famous, but at the time, you know, we, no one knew who we were. And um, where I was living in the space, um, Debbie Harry, the singer, and Chris Stein, the guitarist, they, we were all living together, and they, they had a kind of... Um, kitschy kind of pop interest in sort of occult sort of stuff and you know they have some sort of upside down pentagrams and candles and um, voodoo dolls and things of that sort just for fun and but there was someone else in the in the building uh he was a very uh wild uh extravagant artist and he was very interested in Aleister Crowley the infamous and notorious uh English magician from the 20th century and um, he had one of the uh, Crowley Thoth decks that were the tarot decks. They were, they're, they're, they're well known now, but at the time they were still sort of rare. They weren't as well known. And he would give sort of impromptu tarot readings. And he painted uh, big pictures based on some of the tarot trumps. And um, I became interested in that. And um, I just noticed that other people's places, other flats, uh, on the bookshelves, there were lots of books from, say, the 1960s or the very early 70s, and uh, like Carlos Castaneda and, and uh, Timothy Leary and things of that sort, sort of the previous generation. But one of the books I came across was uh, Colin Wilson's The Occult, and I hadn't had any interest in that sort of thing before. And the only kind of interest I had in The Occult was from reading um, people like H.P. Lovecraft and the sort of weird tales kind of uh, strange fiction, or the horror films from the 1930s and 40s. But because of being in this uh, atmosphere of all well, this kind of occult stuff, I picked it up and started reading it. And it just, um, it, it really grabbed me because um, it wasn't just a book about sort of ghost stories or spells or, you know, that kind of thing. Um, I didn't know at the time, but he had written a lot about existentialism before in philosophy. Mm -hmm. And psychology and things of that sort. And he was looking at the occult in terms of a kind of philosophy of consciousness. And he saw it in terms of um, sort of the hidden powers of the mind. Um, uh, we, we all have much more uh, sort of powers and strengths deep within our minds than we're aware of. And um, he was talking about it in that way. And he also brought in a lot of literature and he talked about people like Goethe and, and W.B. Yeats and Nietzsche, a lot of philosophy, and so I just, and he, it, it's, he just writes so well. He's just a very uh, captivating writer. He has a wonderful narrative style. So I just became absolutely fascinated with it. And um, I subsequently went on um, to hunt down all of his books that I could find in New York, and then when um, I went on tour with the band, whenever, wherever we went to, I would get up early and find, you know, a used bookshop if there was any in town. There wasn't always, but, you know, some places. And I just, I would carry around a bag with just lots of books on the road, as it were. And um, this gradually became almost an obsession. I just 
collected and read and read and read. And he had written so many books, so it was something you could do. You could you could spend a lot of time tracking them down. More than one hundred and fifty books. Uh, yeah, yeah. At the, at the, by the end of his life, yes. And um, I I first met him in kind of a sense of um, just meeting him and asking him to sign a copy of the book in 1981 here in London when I, I was here on holiday uh, and um, I saw that he was going to have a, uh, make an appearance at a bookshop on, on uh, Regent's Park uh, 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 over that way, on uh, Regent Street, and um, I went to it. And this was his book, Frankenstein's Castle, which was about the left and right sides of the brain. And um, I went there and, um, I, you know, sat through the talk and then brought up some books I had bought that day and asked him to sign them. Um, incidentally, funnily enough, um, a fellow named Colin Stanley, who is uh, Colin Wilson's bibliographer, who sort of, you know, uh, made a, a sort of ca a catalog of all of his work, um, he came across a videotape someone had made of that talk. And at the very end of it, you can see me go up and ask him to <laughs> sign it. But then I, I made, in 1983, I made sort of a pilgrimage down to his home in Cornwall, uh, where he had been living um, since about 1957. And um, this was part of what I call a kind of mini search for the miraculous. I went on with a friend of mine. Uh, we went to places like uh, Chartres Cathedral in France. And we also tracked down um, the, uh, where Gurdjieff had his Institute for the Harmonious Development of Man in Fontainebleau, the Prairie. We, we went there and we, we spent some time there. And, uh, but I, I made a sort of solo journey down to Cornwall uh, to meet him. And he was very, very generous and, and very friendly and um, invited me to stay over. And we spent an evening talking about uh, philosophy and phenomenology and drinking quite a bit of wine. And um, then the next day I got back on the train and went to back to London and spent my last week of my trip. And I spent that whole week at the British Library pretty much. Well, the, mm -hmm. the, the reading room in the British Museum that's not there anymore, and, which is a place that's <laughs> sort of famous in the Colin Wilson legend because um, when he was a young man, before he became known and when he was writing his first novel, Rich One in the Dark, and also uh, The Outsider, um, the legend is that he used to sleep up on Hampstead Heath, um, which is a big open space just north of here, uh, in a sleeping bag so that he wouldn't have to pay rent. And yeah. then he would cycle down the hill uh, to the British Museum and spend all day at the, the reading room. So I was kind of emulating that, doing a kind of, you know, uh, kind of copy of that on my own. And then we just subsequently um, carried on a friendship over the next 30 years until he died in uh, 2013. So uh, how was, what was your sense of the man, how, what his personality, your personal taste of what uh, Colin Wilson was well, like? I, I found him to be very warm, very generous, uh, friendly, but um, uh, he was, he, you know, he was, I mean, he had lots of people. I wasn't, I wasn't the only one that, you know, he had people visiting him all the time and um but i got to know him um you know f fairly well but um he you know he kept he's, he's very english so he had kept a bit of distance it wasn't very uh chummy as americans tend to be americans tend to be very very friendly up front and all that and he was a bit it wasn't cold but he kept a bit of distance um very serious and um he stuck to his routine um Whenever I w went down there to to uh, where he lived in Gordon Haven in Cornwall, uh, and where his 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 wife or his widow Joy still lives today, um, he would um, work all day, write all day, and then um, he would sort of emerge from his sort of work room, maybe around late afternoon. Uh, he would take the dogs for a walk along the cliffs, and then he'd come back say five o'clock or something like that, and then uh, you would sit with him and have a glass of wine and have, have a little something before dinner, and then Joy would make a dinner, and then, um, but he basically, he didn't like to talk shop that much, because mm -hmm. he spent all day writing, yeah. so he, he even said, I, I, I must disappoint a lot of people, because the last thing I want to do is sit around and talk about what I've been writing about all day, right. uh, so he would just sit there, have dinner, drink wine, 
the six o'clock news would be on television, and you know he he'd make some comments about that. Um, but um, I mean, it was a um, wonderful place to go because um, I mean the story is that he had something like forty or fifty thousand books that he had bought over the years, and you could see all over the house. I mean, just every every wall had bookshelves on it, and stacks of books, or stacks of DVDs, and stacks of videotapes, and uh, uh, it was an enormous, and then enormous amount of stuff in the house itself, and then outside, over the years, he had made these two sheds that he kept other books in, so he had, there was one, um, there was one shed, it was called the Crime Shed, and that was where he had all his books about criminology and things of that sort, and then there was another um, uh, book, you know, shed with lots of other stuff as well, and um, in more recent times, um, Colin Stanley, who I've mentioned, he, he's gone down there and he's been going through all the papers that uh, left behind after Colin passed away and um, collecting them and organizing them. And he's established up in um, Nottingham University, this uh, Colin Wilson archive up there, which is a, a wonderful thing. It's a, a great resource for people that he suspects will start writing thesis papers or, you know, PhD sort of... Uh, uh, dissertations on, on Colin Wilson's work, uh, and he's been working very, very hard to make that available to people. Uh, we cannot speak about uh, Colin Wilson without speaking about his uh, ideas, and uh, since you wrote about him, what would be your take, how would, would you uh, describe the essence of uh, Colin Wilson's uh, vision, philosophy, mm -hmm. worldview? Well, the thing that he said he wanted to do was to create what he called a new existentialism. And uh, so I mentioned earlier, this was sort of the background he came out of was existentialism. Existentialism was a philosophy or a philosophical literary movement that was very pop popular in the late 1940s and early 1950s uh, in France. It really started a couple decades earlier in Germany with the philosopher Martin Heidegger. Uh, it come, its roots are in an earlier philosophical movement, phenomenology, was a German philosopher, Edmund Husserl. And, um, I mean, there's all different ways to approach it, and all different sort of uh, uh, ways of understanding it. But what Wilson um, found important about existentialism is that it was asking the kinds of questions that uh, fundamentally sort of religion or spiritual pursuits had asked and that in the modern world, um, philosophy uh, had just decided were meaningless. Questions about meaning and purpose, what's the purpose of life, you know, is life meaningful, why are we here, things of that sort. And um, by the early 20th century, uh, philosophy in different parts of, of the world, well, sort of starting in Vienna and then transferring over to the Anglo-Saxon world, uh, it narrowed down its focus to, to something very, very simple, uh, basically kind of uh, linguistics analysis, um, analyzing sentences. You know, what, what can we say? What can't we say? What, what can we know? What can't we know? And all of these big questions, they just decided, well, these are meaningless, that we can't, we can't find any precise meaning for any of them, any, any precise sort of um, subject. Well, when you ask about the meaning of life, how could, you know, there's, this, there's, there, that isn't something we could put under a microscope and, and focus in on it very tightly. Um, although, one of the people responsible for that, the, the Austrian philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein, he was absolutely obsessed by these questions. Mm -hmm. But um, he, reje he basically rejected philosophy, uh, thinking that, you know, philosophy can't really approach these things. But he rejected it not in the sense that the questions aren't important, he rejected in the sense that the kind of philosophical approach to it uh, was wouldn't work, you know, and things like art, or poetry, or music, or religion, they can approach these kind of questions. Um, and existentialism sort of revived these sorts of questions, um, but it tended to have uh, a negative, sort of pessimistic view of things. Um, it, the, it, it's a philosophy of existence. The, uh, as opposed to, say, the kind of philosophy, the metaphysics of an earlier period. Um, say, Plato. Plato's talking about the ideals, these higher metaphysical forms that exist in some transcendental realm, mm -hmm. and uh, they, they inform this world that we live in, but this world is kind of a pale shadow of them, and that, that other world is the real world. But 
existential kind of turned that around and said, well, let's forget all about that. Let's, let's, let's look at the world as it is and where we are now. And this is sort of what Heidegger, uh, uh, being in the world, you know, how, how is it with us? How do we find ourselves in the world? And fundamentally, um, although Heidegger does have some mystical moments, because um, he's very deeply interested in poetry and literature and art, he more or less accepted the idea that existence was meaningless. There isn't any transcendental realm that we can look to to give life meaning. There's, there's no God, there's no platonic realm of ideals, we're just stuck here and now, and we have to make meaning ourselves. And other philosophers like Jean-Paul Sartre and Albert Camus in France, who were influenced by Heidegger, they, they accepted that as well. And um, Wilson could understand their attempt to, uh, he could understand their, their criticism of earlier philosophy. Uh, and he, he also understood that, yes, we, we needed to grapple with these questions of meaning and purpose, but he didn't accept that life was meaningless. He didn't accept this pessimistic view, because he himself had had these moments of deep, overwhelming meaning, these kind of, um, what, what he later came to call peak experiences, mm -hmm. sudden, sudden sort of moments of joy uh, and, and, and happiness, just, just for the sheer fact of existence. And he found this in people like Nietzsche, he found it in people like the poet William Blake, um, the philosopher William James, and many other, many other people as well. And his first book, The Outsider, uh, which he wrote when he was a very young man, uh, and um, living in little bedsits and you know, tiny rooms all over London and cycling around everywhere, uh, he, um, he looked at different characters who, they all shared a, a similar sense that um, they couldn't find a place for themselves in the world. They had a deep hunger for a sense of meaning and purpose that the modern world couldn't provide. The modern world was very good at providing physical comfort mm -hmm. and, and all material needs, but in a way it traded that for these deeper spiritual, uh, religious uh, needs. I mean, his second book, Religion and the Rebel, he, he looked at a possible religious answer to the outsider's dilemma. So the outsider, he doesn't want to be outside, but he finds himself outside of, of the normal run of things. And um, he's faced with moments of deep despair and desolation. Um, what uh, the, the uh, Swedish um, religious thinker, Manuel Swedenborg, called bastations, so these sudden kind of moments where everything, all meaning and purpose, just kind of like empties away, mm -hmm. and you find yourself completely desolate. But he also had, these characters also would have these other moments, when it was a sudden sense of yes, yea saying, mm -hmm. uh, Nietzsche, yea saying, if you know Nietzsche Zarathustra, uh, Nietzsche accepted that the world as it is is meaningless, but human beings are capable of generating these moments of total acceptance in which it doesn't matter whether it's meaningless or not. They have enough kind of energy and power and, and a kind of inner um, strength to, to uh, li live up to that and actually generate a, a kind of meaning. And, and so um, Wilson's outsider is a study of that. So he, he wanted to create a kind of existentialism that would approach these questions of meaning and purpose, but without the premise that life is meaningless. Mm -hmm. So life has a meaning, in, according to, well, he wrote about also power consciousness, right? Mm. How is it related? Well, I mean, fundamentally, he says that these moments when we have a sense that life is absolutely meaningless and desolate, it's because our level of consciousness is too low. Um, one of the central insights that he uh, got from phenomenology, from Edmund Husserl's philosophy, is that Consciousness is intentional. Um, uh, we, we, we tend to think that our consciousness is like a, a, a passive reflection of the world outside. It's like a mirror. And this is something that goes back to René Descartes and uh, the English philosopher Jean Locke, John Locke um, who basically said that uh, there's nothing in the mind that wasn't first in the senses. Mm -hmm. So if you think of we, we are, what he said, tabula rasa, we're blank slates. So... Um, there's nothing in here until things come from outside, so we're basically passive. But Husserl said, no, it isn't like that. He said, actually, consciousness reaches out into the world, and it, it grabs hold of it. So, um, I mean, I'm speaking in metaphors here, but rather than a mirror, it's, it's like, well, he said it's like an arrow that you shoot at the world. 
or it's like a hand that you reaches out and grabs things. And um, when our consciousness is very low, when our intentionality is very low, we have a very weak grasp mm -hmm. of things. So um, that's when it does seem like we're just passive reflections of what's out there. But in, for different reasons, um, moments of great intensity, suddenly that intentionality increases. Mm -hmm. And we can look at anything, and it suddenly seems to be uh, much more fascinating and interesting uh, and full of some kind of hidden meaning than, than we normally would, would think it would be. Um, so when he talks about existence having meaning, it's not as if he's got a plan and saying, well, this is the meaning of life. Here it is all spelled out for you, say, like in the different religions have something like that. It's that um, meaning is a kind of, it's something that we can perceive in things. It's, it's a value that we get back from them. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, when you're bored, when you're kind of depressed, nothing is interesting to you. you and uh, the, your favorite book doesn't move you. Your favorite piece of music doesn't move you. Nothing really moves you at all. But then, um, either through some accidental something happens, you're, you're wakened up out of that. I mean, one of the things that he talks about a lot, and this is um, a theme that runs through The Outsider and one mm -hmm. of his other books, is how crisis, crisis can wake you up. I mean, this is like what the Armenian esoteric teacher Gurdjieff said, we're all asleep, basically. We think we're awake, but we're kind of in a sleeping state, meaning that we, we live at a low level of energy most of the time. We live at a low level of intentionality most of the time. Um, but a sudden crisis, or even an inconvenience, can lift it up somehow. And if you think of us as having as a top layer, that's our ego, rational consciousness, um, that's the one who looks out in the world and says, oh, it's all rather boring and dull, and what's the point of it? Um, but below that, in the unconscious, or whatever you want to call it, subconscious, that, that's where the intentionality takes place. We're, 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 not, we're not consciously aware of the intentionality. Uh, Wilson says we have perceptions, but we also have a will to perceive. Mm -hmm. But that will resides deeper in us, and it's only in sort of moments of crisis then that we make contact with it. He tells a story very often of um, the English writer Graham Greene, Mm -hmm. um, who he, he found his books to be very pessimistic and, and, and um, you know, uh, despairing. And when Green was a um, teenager, he went through horrible, horrible periods of depression. And at one point, uh, he um, was so depressed that when he found um, a revolver uh, that his brother kept um, in a cupboard, he decided to play Russian, Russian roulette mm -hmm. uh, with it. And he took it out into the common and he put a bullet in one of the chambers, and he spun the chambers and put it to his head. And when he pulled the trigger and he heard it click, suddenly, he, you know, I'm, I'm basically doing what Colin would, would do in his talks. He would say, like that, and go, mm, something like that happened. And that kind of, mm, forced that, that intentionality up, up into his conscious self. And then suddenly, the world that had seemed absolutely boring and dull uh, and pointless to Green was suddenly overbrimming with meaning and importance and significance and all that. And so, I mean, that, that view of the world of it being boring and dull and meaningless was false. But he had convinced himself that it was true. And m most of us do, you know, most of the time anyway. Um, and, I mean, it's understandable in one sense because we live in a world where it's, it's very convenient, you know, for, we live in a world, most things, we, we, don't, we don't encounter crisis that often uh, mm -hmm. anymore. I mean, I'm sure, obviously there's lots of people who do, but in a general sense, you know, we live in a world where it's very comfortable, things, you know, are taken care of for us, we don't have to go out and hunt for our food and things of that sort, and so we, we very rarely have any reason to sort of uh, make that kind of effort um, that uh, Green did uh, involuntarily when he played Russian Roulette. But this is something that Wilson's Outsiders did. They went out of their way to put themselves into situations that created crisis because they had some instinctive sense that the comfortable life was a kind of living death. It was a kind of, um, you know, uh, waking sleep. And so they put themselves into uh, inconvenient or, you know, very uh, uncomfortable situations in, in order to somehow stimulate that, that, that sense of life. And uh, as Nietzsche says, live dangerously. 
yeah. uh, in one of his books. And um, Sartre famously said that um, he never felt so free as when he was uh, uh, during the occupation and he was working with the resistance and, and you know, the Germans might find him at any moment or something like that. So um, and that's why, you know, many people seek out thrills and things of that sort. But Wilson's whole philosophy and his, his psychology was about trying to develop ways in order to intensify that intentionality mm -hmm. without having to resort to crisis. So the final question about uh, Colin Wilson, uh, he, uh, he did an analyze various types of outsiders and he seemed to have found at least a path towards this, as he said, positive uh, resolution. So what would be your take on that positive resolution? How to cultivate this uh, meaningful power, power consciousness states? Well, basically he said, if we understand the theory that um, what, what generates these kind of moments of sudden meaning um, isn't the crisis itself, it's our response to the crisis. So, uh, you know, when Green put the gun to his head, it wasn't the gun that did it, it was him, you know, <clears throat> going like that. Um, so, if we could find a way to make that effort, and this is what he, he worked on, and he tells a story of how um, when New Year's Eve he was um, giving a talk, it was a, a, a seminar, uh, in Devon somewhere, um, and uh, there was a terrific snowfall uh, that night. And when um, everyone was leaving, like the next day, they, they couldn't go because there was too much snow. I mean, the, the cars were all snowed in and, and the roads were all covered in snow. And um, finally, they managed to dig his car out, and so he was one that could get going. But he found that... Um, until he got to the main highway, he had to go through these narrow roads. And if you know, if you know the narrow roads down in uh, Devon and Cornwall, they're very, <laughs> very, very narrow. And, um, and there were snow banks on the other side. And he couldn't tell whether there was a ditch there or whether there was solid ground. So he had to stick to this very narrow road and actually go very slowly. And in order to do that, he had to sort of pay attention. You know, he had to basically uh, focus his mind on doing that. And he found that after doing that for quite some time, because it took him quite a while, because he had to go very, very slow through these narrow roads, driving like this, making sure he didn't go to one side or the other, because he could have just fallen into a ditch. Um, he found that by the time he got to the highway and could relax, suddenly it seemed like everything around him had opened up. Um, and it's... it's um, it's something that he earlier had called the, the indifference threshold. And this is somehow where we unconsciously devalue everything. We somehow, some part of ourselves says, well, I don't need to put enough energy, I don't need to put so much energy into this. I, I only need to put, you know, a little bit in order to deal with this, right? And we unconsciously accept that. But if some crisis or inconvenience forces us to realize, actually, no, I, I need to put a bit more in order to deal with this, then we do have this energy in us that we can draw up. And he found that that's what he did while by going through this, you know, uh, having to drive through the snow. Um, and by the time he got to the highway, he just could relax and go like that, and suddenly everything opened up around. It was the same effect as when Graham Greene put the gun to his head, whereas Greene did it all at once in a very, you know, a spasm of, of kind of uh, concentration. Wilson had done it over a couple hours, um, in, in a more kind of um, focused, continuous way. So it wasn't one eh, like that, it was like this. And he tells the story of one of the Zen masters uh, who was asked by a pupil, you know, could you, could you give us a guide? Could you give us some words to help us in our, in our studies and work? And he said, attention. Yeah. And he said, well, can you give us a bit more than that? He said, attention, attention. <laughs> and he had one more time, he said, attention, attention, attention. And this is what it is. It's somehow learning how to focus the mind in this way. And we, again, I think you can see that we already unconsciously have methods of doing that. Art, literature, poetry. I mean, one of the things Wilson writes about a lot is sex. I mean, sex is a way to, is a, is a way to focus. Or sex does focus the attention, yeah. uh, at, least, at least in males. Uh, it, it focuses in this intensity. Um, and um, 
this is why he says for many people like Casanova and Henry Miller, uh, they're constantly you know going after women trying to conquer them and it's believing it's the women themselves or the conquests that are creating this wonderful feeling and actually it's the, the tightening of their mind that, that does it. Uh, and so um, so it's that. He, I mean, and this is what he says. I mean, when you mentioned power consciousness. Um, there was a book he put out um, a few years before he passed away called Super Consciousness and it was something he had worked on for a long time. It was kind of like a how-to. Um, I mean, he doesn't really write about exercises, but he tries to explain the theory. I mean, he's, his approach is, if you understand the theory, you'll see what you need to do, rather than give you a bunch of exercises to do. So if you understand that we're normally in this kind of dull, half-alive state, which we accept as normal, but some sudden crisis of inconvenience will make us tighten our mind, and that, that creates the peak experience. And he got the term peak experience from Abraham Maslow, the American psychologist, uh, who studied people in which this happened normally. It, it, yeah. it just sort of happened spontaneously. So we all have this capacity. These kind of mystical experiences are, are not that far away, um, but we have to understand how. Understand how it is that we don't have them most of the time. I mean, that, that's one of the important things that I think that separates Wilson from a lot of other people who write about consciousness. He's not really writing about altered states that much. He's, he's trying to understand why we are in such a low level of consciousness now, what, what, what creates a situation. Um, and, uh, but yeah, it's fundamentally learning how to focus the mind uh, over time. And um, I think if you, if you do do that, you, you, you can notice little changes. You know? I mean, I, I notice it when I'm writing. If I'm writing for a long time, I can, by the end of the day, I do feel a bit, you know, I'm physically tired, but I do feel like I'm getting more back from things and I'm looking at them. Yeah. Like more active consciousness. Probably that's how and why he wrote so many books. Like, not just uh, earning a living, but also in intensifying his consciousness. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, so, uh, I have a few other questions mm -hmm. about your own work, but I suggest we'll make a short break, uh, like one minute, mm -hmm. and after that we'll return to sure. our interview.